Lord, we want to thank you for this chance to be here. Thank you that we live somewhere where we get to uh, do this openly and freely. And we thank you for your word, and we ask you to help us make um, good use of this time, um, good use of, of these blessings, um, and to leave here today uh, with a better understanding of you, closer to you and closer to each other, um, better equipped to uh, love and serve you in the week ahead. Um, and ask all this and more and better in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right, so we are, for those of you who are new, we got a couple. We are in week three of six. So we spent the first two weeks um, laying out um, some really foundational stuff for what the Christian life is. We got, we got at the top of your sheets. Does anyone not have a sheet? Can I okay. Ask you a quick question? Yeah. Sorry. Um, You're fine. We had a, a lovely senior lady here named Lou. Lou, yeah. And I haven't seen her for a few weeks now. Mm -hmm. She was coming to church a couple times. Uh, she came in here one night, mm -hmm. and now it's finished. Does anybody know her? I do. You do? Mm -hmm. okay. I don't know what's going on with her right now. I'd have to email her and get back to you. Could you do that? Because um, I'm, I'm just personally concerned and want to check on her and make sure everything's okay. And, uh, Anything we can do to sure, I can do that and let you know next week. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, sorry. Oh, no, you're fine. You're fine. Anything else? Okay. Let's jump into our review at the top. Um, this, is, this is a quick uh, recap of what we spent a lot of time building the last couple weeks. So um, we'll see if, if we've got some of this. Biblically, a Christian is a disciple. That's what this word means in Scripture. Christian is a name that was given to what the, uh, the disciples, what Jesus called um, disciples. In other words, a what? What is a disciple? A follower. A disciple is a follower of Christ. A Christian is a follower of Christ. That's what that word means biblically. To follow Christ, we must repent. In other words, what? Turn. Turn, uh, turn from... There, there's, the Bible spends a lot of time setting up God's way versus our ways. How His ways are higher than ours. His thoughts are higher than ours. Our ways are worse. Um, one, of the, one of the things that the Scripture says is that we have all turned to our own ways. Um, and so the, the thing that Jesus and His followers called people to was to repent, to turn back from our worst ways to His ways. So we must turn by what? Faith. By faith. This is a trust that God's ways are better than our ways, that He does know better than us. Um, we turn back from our ways by faith from what? Sin, selfishness to selflessness, seeking good for others. This has to do with, um, again, we talked about biblically what sin and love mean. These are words that mean a whole lot of different things in our culture and have um, in the 2,000 years since Jesus was here. But scripturally, they have a lot to do with, um, Scripture says everything that does not come from faith is what? In Romans, everything that does not come from faith is sin, it says. And, he, and Paul also writes that the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So we see this, uh, all the law and prophets, all the commandments in the scripture hang on what? What two commands? Loving God, loving your neighbor. Loving the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, mind and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said that everything hangs on those. So we see that all the commandments have to do with love. Okay? And on the other hand, everything that does not come from faith expressing itself through love is sin. So everything that falls short of that, where, where what we do is an expression of our trust in God and our love for Him, our belief that He knows better than us, um, and so we do things His way instead of ours. Everything that falls short of that, wholehearted, whole mind, whole self devotion to God's better ways, it, is sin. Okay? So we have this, this choice that's set up in Galatians 5 and Romans 8 and elsewhere where we're going to focus on what, what we want, what our flesh wants, what our sin nature wants, depending on your uh, translation, or we're going to do what God wants, what the Spirit wants. And, and this is where we're going here with this. From seeking what we want, our old selfishness that wants what we want at any cost to anyone or anyone else, to seeking what who wants? God, God wants. If we are going to be called to love which means scripturally seeking others good. We saw this. This has less to do with how you feel about them than with seeking their good, with seeking their interests. 
Um, and God knows best. Again, that's where the faith part comes in. If He knows best what's good for everyone, turning from our selfishness, our sin, to love involves doing things His way instead of your way. Where there is conflict, and there always is, between what you want and what God wants, between what anyone else wants, your children, your spouse, your neighbor, your friend, your enemy, and what God wants. We looked at this a lot last week. The, the, the call of Christ was always to pick whose way? God's way. Always. Always. In the trust that He knows better. He knows better what's best even for your kids and your family and your, your neighbors and your enemies and whomever. He knows better what's best for all of them than you do, than they do, than anyone does. Okay? In short, we must turn from see, doing things our ways to doing things whose way? God's way. This is the, the whole deal. We spent a lot of time on this, but if we're really going to make this simple, you're, when it comes down to who's, who's in charge, who is boss, who decides what wins the day, who decides how you handle your time, your money, your mouth, your body, your whatever, we are called as followers of Christ to follow Him in His ways, to turn from our ways, from anyone else's ways, to do things His way. Okay? Questions, comments, objections on any of that before we build from here? Okay, so why? Why would we do this? Why would we follow Christ? Um, and we're going to take a step back from there. Why would we follow anyone? What would be a reason to follow someone? <laughs> so there's a great start. They know what they're doing and we don't. What else? They want to change. Okay. Okay. What else? Be with them or near them. Okay. That's certainly part of it too, right? Certainly part of it. Um, let's look at this passage in John 14. Um, someone want to read that for us? Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him. Okay, now there's a lot here, as we've talked about before, we're not going to unpack everything there is to unpack in all of these scriptures, we don't have time for that. But, but one of the, a couple of things I want you to notice here, I will come back and take you to be with me, why? In verse 3. Huh? I know, but what does he say specifically, the that? What is the reason to bring us with him? So we can be with him, okay? There's not, there's not another reason here. It's not, you, I'm bringing you back to be with me so that whatever it is that you're hoping for in heaven. All, we talked about last time, all the good things are found in him, okay? But the ultimate thing he is promising and offering is that we can be with him. That is what he wants. I am bringing you with me so that, yes, so every tear will be wiped away, so there will be no more suffering, so there will be all those good things. But ultimately what he wants is to bring us to be with him so that we can be with him. That's, that's what he wants. There's not another thing. All of it comes with him, but what he wants is to be with him. And when Thomas says, we don't know where you're going, how, how could we possibly know the way? He says, I am the way. You, you don't have to know anything else. You don't have to know where we're going. You don't have to figure out the next step. You, you, if you know me and follow me, you have the way. I am the way. What I'm offering you is me. Okay? We've, we're following all this. And we landed here last time. What he ultimately wants from us is what? Ourselves. Us. And what he ultimately wants to give us is what? Himself. Him. Him. He wants us and he wants to give us him. And again, all, everything follows from that. If we have, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. We looked at all sorts of verses that said these sorts of things. Without Him, we have no good thing. We lose everything when we lose Him. And when we get Him, we get everything with Him. Okay? But the point, the, the point He's pushing at is this. He wants to give us Him and He wants us. He wants this restored, reconciled relationship. This fixed relationship with us. Okay? 
The point of all of this, reconciled, restored, mutually loving. Again, he has loved us. He wants us to love back relationships with God. Um, John 3.16, someone read it. Yeah, and we, we talked last time about the price he paid to reconcile us, the enormous cost, and the reason was love. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, you are dearly loved, and so you should do what? Live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up, and this we saw before too, for us as a fragrant sacrifice and offering to God. He loved us as part of his love for God because God loves us, right? And we are called to the exact same thing. 2 Corinthians 5, who wants to read that? And he died. Alright, all right, I got it. Sorry about that. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Okay, another that, another so, there's a cause here. He died for us so that we would stop living for us and start living for him, that we would begin to love back, right? He died for us so that, again, a very clear cause, this is why he did it, whether we are awake or asleep, and again, in context, awake or asleep means alive or dead, if you look at the context in 1 Thessalonians 5. We may live together with him. He wants this reconciled, fixed relationship with us, okay? Um, any, any questions, comments, objections? Because this is we're going to take this as the jumping off point for everything we do from here. Are we clear on this much before we go on? Okay. Now, we do not get reconcile to stay estranged, right? The point of fixing a relationship is not so that you can then go back to never talking to each other again, right? right. That, that, there's, no, there's no point in reconciling if you're going to go on living as if the other person doesn't exist. Okay? That's not what he wants. That's not what he's after. 2 Corinthians 6, we've seen this phrase in, in several places. As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. Paul talks about this more than once. Um, and we saw some of the ways we could do this last week, where a, a faith that does not change your life, a faith that bears no works, no love, is not a real faith, a faith in uh, my own goodness or my own, uh, you know, church things that I've done is not a real faith, okay? Um, and certainly, someone read for us Titus 1 here. They claim to know God, but in their actions they deny Him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Okay, so uh, a, a big part of believing in vain is, is a, a belief that does not change the way you live. Okay? It, 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 this, these people claim to know God, but their actions show what? They don't. they don't. Their actions deny that He exists, or that He is good, or that He knows better, or any number of things that the Scripture tells us about God. Okay? Now, so if this, is, if this is one way that we can talk about believing in vain, I want to I make the next step here. If God wants this relationship with you this bad, He paid the price of the cross to reconcile you to Him, does He want you to go on living as if He doesn't exist? He does not. He absolutely does not. Okay? He wants a relationship with you now and forever. So, Yes. We were just talking about that on the way over here. Toronto. Beautiful. Welcome. I mean, exactly that. Yes. <laughs> Thank God for that, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. He, he, might be, uh, he might be trying to say something to you guys tonight. Actually, he is trying to say something to me because it took a lot for me to get, in, get back in here. Um, I just fresh off work, so um, what's been on my mind, my one of my best friends, she's been missing for two days. And I'm like the only one she talked to, she's not even from here. She's from Mona somewhere. I had a look at it on my Facebook, but she don't know nobody out here like that. And for her to not no one know what she been in or she don't have a phone to contact nobody. She just been on my heart 
Yeah. Yeah. You do me a favor. Yeah. Will you make sure we we pray for her before you leave today? Can you remind me at the end of class? Thank you. I want I want to make sure we do that. And, and let's use this as a reminder that none of this is is ha supposed to happen just in your head. Okay. If we really believe what the scripture teaches, it should change the way you look at everything, the way you do everything, the way you handle everything, the way you respond to everything, which includes real hurt, okay, real pain that is around you. Um, and so that, that, that is a good reminder because where we're going with this is prayer, okay. Prayer is what we're going to talk about next. What do relationships need? If he wants a relationship with us, need is our next blank. What do they need? How do they work? What does it mean to live together? To have a relationship with someone, what, what does that mean? What does that look like? It's like a good, a good portion of it's communication. All right, you've got to be in communication, right? You don't have a relationship if there's no communication. It just doesn't exist. Sure. Trust. Absolutely. Respect. Trust and respect. Yes. And we talked last time about part of loving him back as being part of a mutually respectful, mutually trusting thing. He has respected and, tr and loved us. He, he has done his part. We have not. And so we're, we're trying to step into our role. That's part of what the cross is supposed to be able to do, to lift us up into be, being a mutual, a part of a mutually loving, mutually trusting, mutually trustworthy and respectful thing. Um, so how does this work with God? That's our next blank. What is the same? What is different? What does it mean to have a relationship with God? I, I, I would think that a relationship That's a, that is a beautiful segue here. Is any one of you in trouble? James 5, he should do what? Is anyone happy? Let him do what? Sing songs of praise. 1 Thessalonians 5, be joyful always. Pray what? how much? Pray continually. Pray without ceasing. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And we see Jesus do this. He often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Uh, we are not talking about praying, as Tyron said, only when you need something or only when things are hard or, or only, only anything. Only insert anything in the blank here. We're talking about constant, continual, ceaseless prayer. When you're happy, when you're sad, in all occasions, with all kinds of prayers. Okay? How does prayer factor into this relationship? If we're going to use Bob's word here, what are we talking about? Communication, okay? It opens the line of communication. Yes. Line With someone who has been pursuing us, right? Someone who has pursued us at the, at the, even to the cross. We're talking about response, response, opening the lines of communication from our end, okay? Um, what is prayer? Getting real simple here. Prayer is talking with whom? With God. And God is a what? Person. A person. Okay? Now this is important because a lot of times we have this sense that there's some spirit force universe people say oftentimes now that we're throwing up wishes toward. That we hope is hearing us. Hope will be 
you know, inclined to us, hope will do something to benefit us. That's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about, um, you know, bending some force to our will. We're not talking about, you know, manipulating um, spirits, whatever. We're talking about a person. We're talking about a smarter, better person than you have ever known, and that's who you're talking to. Prayer is talking with a person. Uh, so, who or what tends to be your focus when you pray? You don't have to answer that out loud, but that is a fair question. If I am talking to Brenda, and all I'm talking about, thinking about, is me, Brenda and I aren't having much of a conversation. <laughs> Brenda, you could ch exchange Brenda with anyone else, and it's going to be the same conversation, because it's not about Brenda, it's about me. Okay? That's not what we're after here in prayer. That's not what Scripture pushes us toward. So we're going to look at four different kinds of prayer that we see in Scripture. They're really just, here's our next blank, four different kinds of talking. We talk to each other in something like all these as well, or, or should at least. So this is a very famous model for prayer. We're going, to, we're going to talk about what these types of prayer are. The Acts model. Adoration, which is uh, as an A word we needed for the, for, the, uh, for the thing here. Praise is basically adoration. Acknowledging the greatness of God. Confession, which has to do with acknowledging our failures and shortcomings. Thanksgiving, which has to do with acknowledging His goodness to us. And supplication. We'll deal with that next time. This is prayer requests. This is what most people talk about when they talk about prayer. It's a request for supplies. Um, they needed an S to fill out the Acts thing, so they, they got a big you know, $10 word here. But this has to do with acknowledging our dependence on Him. Um, so we're going to start with the first two tonight, adoration and confession. So what is adoration? What does it mean to adore? This word has to do with adoring. What does it mean to adore someone? Yes. Yes. What else? What were you saying, Bob? It means to idolize. Okay. Any other thoughts? What are you doing when you are adoring someone or something? Praise. Mm-hmm. How much you love them. Mm-hmm. Buttering them up. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. What you saying? Buttering them up. Ah. <laughs> uh, to affirm what's true about it. Okay. Now, now this is getting at something too, right? Um, well, are you thinking about the things that bother you about this person, the things that annoy you about this person, the things that you wish were different about this person, the things that, is, is that praise? No. Is that a adoration? Is that adoring? No. no. What, what sorts of things are we thinking about? The things about the person that we admire, respect, enjoy, love. love, appreciate, all that sort of stuff. That's adoring at a very basic level. You are focused. Your attention and adoration is focusing on the things that you appreciate, admire, love about this other person. Um, now, I'm going to split a hair here, uh, and it's, it's only somewhat important, but this is not the same as Thanksgiving, though they are similar. Thanksgiving is more focused on actions, while praise is more focused on attributes, what the actions show about, in this case, who God is. So, we're going to see in even these verses that praise and thanksgiving often go hand in hand. But the, the point I'm trying to make here with this distinction is, um, I think I actually have it here. Okay, it's possible to be thankful in a shallow way that stays self-centered, focused on how the other person benefits us, thus reducing his or her inherent value. What I mean by that is, when all I think about is how you benefit me, what I'm really thinking about is me. I'm not thinking about you. Not really. Okay? Praise adoration works against this by pushing us to consider the other person further. Pushing us to think about them, who they are, as shown by the things that they do. Okay? So, Psalm 117, before we go, move on. Everyone, everyone following that? The, the, what we're trying to do here is think about who God is. So praise the Lord, all you nations, extol him, all you peoples, for great is his love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. We are praising him for his great love and for his enduring faithfulness. Um, I have a bunch 
a bunch of praise verses here that we're not going to read through all of them out loud. But I want you to just take a couple minutes and skim through these. And if one jumps out at you, read it for us. Even if it's just a few verses from a long passage. I will, you know, the first one right off the bat, Isaiah 63, I will tell of the kindness of the Lord and the deeds for which he is to be praised. Yes. Yes, and the good things he has done, it says later, according to his compassion and many kindnesses, his, what he has done, show us that he is kind. Show us that he is compassionate. And that, that is something to praise him for. See the sovereign Lord come with power. Yes. And yeah. Uh, notice in the next verse, what is his reward? Isaiah 40, 11, what is he doing? He's shepherding, He's shepherding his flock. Yeah. What is the reward that is with him? It is his, his redeemed people, right? Again, this is what he is after. This is what he is after. He is coming with power, but what he's after is not to trample us, not to dominate us, to gather us, to shepherd us. So like uh, 17 and 18, Before him all nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. To whom then will you compare God? What image will you compare him to? Yes. No one compares. No one compares. No one compares. He is the creator of all nations. Yes. And this drives home that point we talked about last time, that he's not trying to get something from us as if he needs something from us. He doesn't need anything from us. Nothing. We need everything. Yes. Psalm 8, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Yeah, yeah. And this was written without knowing what we know about the size of the heavens and the size of the stars. Many people nowadays think if the universe is that big, there's no way we matter. There's no way, you know, the, the earth matters. That isn't the biblical teaching, right? The biblical teaching is it is incredible that we matter to him, given all this that he can do. I became a Christian and I came across Numbers 23. I was yes. like, whoa, okay, she was speaking scripture to me. And I yeah. didn't even know it. Yeah. You know? So God's not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. Yes. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Yes. <laughs> he has no need to lie. He never gets new information to change his mind, okay? He's not, he's not like us. He's not double-minded. No, no, never. Oh, yeah. I can answer. Any others? I know there's a lot here. We don't have to talk about all of them. Are there any others that jump out at you? It kind of goes along with the adoration. Shout for joy, O heavens. Rejoice over the first thing of the song of the Yes, yes. One of my favorites here is, is near the end of this group, Psalm 62. Um, one thing God has spoken in verse 11. Two things I have heard, that you, O God, are strong and that you, O Lord, are loving. Um, th this combination is so important and, and it's all over Scripture. If he was loving and not strong, he might mean well for us, but it wouldn't matter. And if he was strong and not loving, it would not go well for us. No. no, no. It is this combination, this incredible combination of his power and his love that is so praiseworthy and so rare. We don't see that in, in our world. We talk about how power corrupts and power, oh, absolute power corrupts absolutely. To have power 
creates such temptation to use it for our purposes and to trample other people. And that isn't, that isn't our God. Well, it uh, really is unique. Absolutely unique. Absolutely unique. Yes. Um, okay. So, gosh. I would like to spend more time doing that. that I, I enjoyed that. Um, but we're going we're gonna to move from here. Spend time doing this on your own. That is the encouragement for tonight. Okay. Um, how is this good for our relationship with God in both directions? How is it good for our relationship with God to spend time thinking about what is good about Him, about what is admirable about Him? Well, it makes us appreciate and realize where all of our blessings come from. Yes. We appreciate Him more. We can quickly, or, well, that we, I will say for myself, which I can quickly take for granted. Yes. I think we can say we. I don't know much of anyone who doesn't do that. <laughs> if, you've, if you've met a child, how quickly they take for granted um, everything they're given. Um, anything else? How is this good for our relationship with God? You know, the more you, you praise Him and, and the more we read this, um, it quickens our spirit. We just want to praise Him more. Yes. It's just like a fountain yeah. that gets started and yeah. we don't want it to stop. Very yeah. reassuring. Yes. To go over this. And, yes. And just to talk about it in a group like this. Yeah. Encouraging, I think, for all group like Yes. I think it orients us to who we're talking to as yes. well. Yes. Um, yes. Help us get in the right mind space of His Majesty and sort of be in awe of, of this. Yes. Uh, privilege. Yes. <laughs> Privilege is a good word. What were you going to say, Bob? Oh, I was going to say, uh, you know, like, uh, like if you were somewhere, you know, in your former life, and you met Jesus, and you got out, and uh, you love him, and and then the love just continues, and the faith grows, and, uh, you know, it's just, I never seen anything like it until now. Yeah. Well, I, don't, I don't know how to, I wish I could ESP it out there, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Lou, were you going to say something? It keeps us, and it keeps reminding us and to remember him, yes. even when things aren't that great. Yes, which they aren't sometimes, right? It's, yes. like, it's really good when everything's going good and fine, but understanding that he's responsible for everything. Yeah. And it's all knowing that even when things are rough, he's he's part of that too. Yeah. And may, maybe <laughs> we should be thankful for that also. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we actually see that we tend to forget these things in good times and bad. That's one of the things that, you, uh, that, that God warned the Israelites when he led them into the promised land. I'm going to establish you here, and things are going to go well for you. And then you're going to forget that it all came from me. You're going to forget, and you're going to think this all came from you. Um, and, and we have a tendency in good and bad, if we're not careful, to forget who he is and what he has done um, and what he can do. We forget all that stuff so fast because we get looking at us and our stuff. All right? Yeah. Open yes. To him, so yes. It makes it easier for him to understand where we're coming from, or, or at least us to be open to him, right? Uh, we don't always have the words that we need. Where the yes. Does. Yes. Exactly, and that's straight out of scripture, right? Um, and it also says that he inhabits the praises of his people, right? That he, that he comes to meet us in praise. Um, so. Um, it's good for any relationship. This is one point, right? It's good for any relationship to spend time thinking about the good in the other person. Any relationship you have with any person, no matter how flawed, if you spend some time thinking about what you like and admire and enjoy about that person, it's going gonna, it's gonna to help the relationship. So this is part of it. The more, here's another part of it, the more we recognize the extent of his goodness, his strength and his love, the easier and more natural it is, and this is where I think Bob was going with this, the easier and more natural it is for us to trust him. 
to trust him. That's our faith. That is the, the fulcrum for moving into his ways and not ours, right? And thus to obey him. That is to love him. To love him is to obey him. We saw that in the first couple of weeks. If you love me, you will obey what I command, Jesus said multiple times. To prefer his ways to our own. The better we remember, the better we recognize how much better, stronger, smarter, wiser, loving, kinder, all that he is than us, the easier it is to, to trust him, to do things his way instead of our way. It's harder to take seriously your belief that you know best if you're really looking at yourself in comparison to the, to the, to the real God, okay? Um, and how is that good for all of our relationships? That's our next blank. Yes. 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 Because you know that it's going to still be a good relationship tomorrow and the next day, you know. Yeah. You have all that, all that yeah. for you. Yeah. Yeah. We seem to walk around with this entitlement. Yes. And so, even though we think the other person's wrong, that might not be necessarily so. Yes. And whether they're wrong also, us having a fit about it mm -hmm. for days isn't appropriate either. This is humbling, right? right? There is a God and you are not Him. That is good for you to remember. That is good for me to remember. I, I want to get up in the morning from birth and have everybody around me serve me. Do what I want. When I want it. That's my default. That's what the Bible calls your flesh, your sin nature. Th these people don't exist to serve you, okay? This helps you remember that. This helps me remember that. That's not why they're here. They don't live to serve you, okay? You're not the center of all this. In Him, all things hold together. All things were made by Him and for Him, okay? Not you, not me. This is good for us to remember. It's good for, the, for everything in our lives, okay? Now, this is not about phoniness or play acting. There is a way to praise that is, is, as we saw last time, they honor me with their lips and their hearts are far from me. That's not what we're after here. This is not about phoniness or play acting. That's bad for relationships, especially with God. God always knows. God is not mocked. We talked about that a lot last time. It's about acknowledging even a fraction of who He is, how great and awesome and loving He is. What we are after is the truth about His goodness, not, not a mustering up some phony praise that we don't really believe. That's not what we're after here, and that is not honoring to God. And it often takes time. This is the other side of this coin. It often takes time for us to work this into our hearts. To get our hearts, remember uh, when Jesus was talking to the disciples after he came back, it says in Luke 24 that he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. And his criticism of them was how foolish you are and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have written. Slow of heart. It didn't matter. They'd, they'd been taught all this stuff, but their hearts didn't, didn't really believe it. Okay, um, And that's, that's so often our trouble here. Praise sometimes has to work into our hearts. It sometimes takes time to get your heart to acknowledge these truths about God. But the more we take that time to consider who God really is, no matter how you feel about it, the more we find to praise Him for, and the more joy we find in doing so. And this is some of what I think Frank was saying a moment ago, that this thing feeds itself. The more you see to praise Him for, the more you want to praise Him. Okay, so in Psalm 147, we won't read all these again, there's a lot here, but how good it is to sing praises to our God, how pleasant and fitting to praise Him. It, it is a good, fitting, pleasant thing when we see who He is. For great is our Lord and mighty in power, and His understanding has no limit. Um, it talks about His unfailing love there. Uh, Psalm 34, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. Verse 8 on the back. Taste and see that the Lord is what? Taste and see that He is good. We're not talking about uh, deluding ourselves into believing something that isn't true. We're talking about tasting what is really there and finding the goodness in it. For your love is better than life in Psalm 63. It is fitting for the upright to praise Him in Psalm 33. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all He does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of His, his what love? 
His unfailing love. We see that again multiple times in this passage. His unfailing love. That the Lord's love does not run out. It is not um, fickle. It is not there some days and not others, sometimes and not others, only when you feel it, only when you believe it, n none of that. It is unfailing. His love is a constant. A constant. That is an incredible thing. The process of acknowledging who God is grows real trust in the real God. Those are our next blanks. Trust grounded in truth that endures even in difficulty. If your praise, if your trust is based on an illusion, it won't hold up. Yes. The process of acknowledging who God is grows real trust in the real God. Trust grounded in truth that endures even in difficulty. If you want to make up a phony God in your head, that, that is, is uh, only focused on you and your things, um, that God is not going to be good enough for the real world. It's, it's not going to help you when real things come crashing in on your life. The real God, understanding who He is, that is your hope of building a foundation that will last through the hard times. Okay. Because the truth is coming at you. It will come at you. The good and bad of the truth is coming at you. If you're trying to ignore truth in the way you're looking at God, it's not going to last. It's not going to work. Truth is coming home. Okay? Um, any questions, comments, objections before we go on? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Do what you need to do. Anything else? All right, here's another way this benefits us. Just as his actions help us identify his attributes, so we've talked about this, what he does shows us who he is. So his attributes, who he is, help us in interpret and anticipate his actions. So now we're talking about taking what we've learned from this and applying it forward, okay? Your hands made me and formed me. Give me understanding to learn your commands. I know, that, O oh Lord, that your laws are righteous, and in faithfulness you have afflicted me. May your unfailing love be my comfort, according to your promise to your servant. Let your compassion come to me, that I may live, for your law is my delight. Now, when he says, in faithfulness you have afflicted me, what is he saying? Afflicted me in love? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to, to be afflicted? Like infected, uh, uh, given more of something. Affliction is not pleasant, right? No. This is not a good word. This is not a pleasant word, at least. We have been afflicted. We have been uh, affected by something unpleasantly, okay? Um, often afflictions, we're talking about illnesses or injuries or those sorts of things. But it doesn't have to be physical, obviously. Um, but this affliction has come in the Lord's what? In his faithfulness, he has afflicted him. And he asked for his unfailing love to be my comfort. So this guy, even in his affliction, has he, is he doubting the, the love of the Lord? He is at least taking time to, to, to mentally remind himself, right, that the Lord's love is unfailing, even in this affliction, that, that there is some faithfulness of God in this affliction. And he's asking for your unfailing love to comfort me. Now, this is a guy who's living in the real world living in affliction, and reminding himself, God is faithful. God will be faithful in this, and I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to seek and pray to him that I will see his unfailing love in this, because I trust that it's here. I trust that it's here. Okay, this is a man who has spent time learning who the real God is, and he's leaning on that now in affliction. Yes, sir? Is that sort of like the Job deal? Yeah. Yeah. Job does this better at some times than others in those, you know, 40 chapters. But yes, Job, Job definitely has statements like this, right? That, that I'm, I will, the uh, Lord gave and the Lord take away, blessed be the name of the Lord. I, I'm going I'm to trust in him and I'm going to praise him um, even in this. Um, Lamentations 3, if you know anything about Lamentations, um, if, you, if you read this book, if you read Jeremiah, Horrible things are happening in Jerusalem at this time. Uh, horrible things. ISIS-type stuff is happening, okay? Um, 
And in this context, I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Down in verse 32, though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love, for he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to the children of men. This is a man who is in severe grief and affliction, remembering the unfailing love and compassion of the Lord and finding them new every morning in his surroundings. And that is not happening, I can tell you, by accident. That is not just the way your heart and mind will drift in affliction. That is not where they are going. Okay? This comes from practice. Practice intentionally reminding yourself of the goodness of God. Okay? Um, Joel 2, blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm. Um, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. We're talking now about his righteous judgment on its way. Skip to verse 13. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing. Even when judgment is imminent, we are going to rest and hope and pray toward God's unfailing love and His willingness to return to us if we will return to Him. Our trust and His desire to be reconciled to us. Okay? So here we have, we have taken some time to learn the attributes of God and we are trying to apply them even in affliction, even in judgment, even in all these things, to remember who the real God is in a way that changes our response to these even horrible things. Okay? Any questions, comments, objections on any of that? Yes, sir. Um, you know, this reminds me of in Revelation, the same thing is happening. That judgment and God calling. I mean, the yes. door is still open and it just keeps doing that. Now, there is a point where you, you don't close it. Yes. But, but this, you know, the compassion... Still there. Yes. So it's, just, it's comforting. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And we see we see places in Scripture where it says that His kindness was meant to draw you to repentance, and we see places in Scripture where His judgment is meant to draw us to repentance. Where he, He's trying every possible thing. The aim is always to draw us back to reconciliation. That that is always the aim. The aim is never to steal and kill and destroy. That's the enemy's aim. His aim is that we would have life and have it to the full. Is it selfish or arrogant for God to call us to praise and adore Him? No. Okay. Certainly, it, here in church, and Sunday school or whatever, the answer is no, right? Why is it not? It now, now let's, let's, let me contextualize this properly. It would be, it would be wrong and selfish and arrogant and weird if I said what we're going to do for the next five minutes is talk about what you guys admire about me. Okay? That would be weird. And it would be, it would be selfish and arrogant. And it wouldn't be actually good for any of us in the long run, including me. Um, why is it different with God? Yeah? I think, I think it's his right. I mean, he, he created us. He created us to do what he wants us to do. And, and just think it's fair. You know? There's nothing selfish about it. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yes, ma'am. He bought us. He bought us. He did. With a price, right? Mm -hmm. He did. Um, He's the only one that's worthy of that. That's the word I was looking for. Exactly. Yes. So this is a, an enormous difference. Uh, and, uh, you know, a, a, I, can't, I, can't, I don't even have the words for the difference between what he deserves and what I deserve in this regard, right? I mean, it, it is 
there is no comparison. So here we have certainly this idea in Scripture, right? In Psalm 145, Great is the Lord and most what? Worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom, for he is gracious and compassionate, good to all, has compassion on all he has made. Um, on the back, we, won't, we don't have time to read all these. Um, but if I am a father in Malachi 1, now this is a place where he is, um, he is criticizing the priests and others for the way they have represented him. If I am a father, where is the honor due me? If I am a master, where is the respect due me? He talks about how they're bring, trying to bring the worst parts of the flock um, to sacrifice to him. He says, try offering the, them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you? And he finally says, my name will be great among the nations. Um, says the Lord Almighty, for, my, for I am a great king and my name is to be feared among the nations. To treat him with less respect than your governor, your father, your boss, whomever, um, is, is entirely upside down. Um, in Revelation 5, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was, could open the scroll or even look, to, look inside it. And I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy. This is in the, in the judgment room of heaven in Revelation 5. And then the Lamb comes in verse 6. And in verse 9, someone read that, that passage that's bolded there. Yes, ma'am. And this is exactly what you were just saying, isn't it, Brenda? A worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. He is worthy of this in a way that no one else is. All right, so this is one point. God is worthy of, He deserves all honor and praise, and so it's good and right and even healthy for us to give it to Him. And we've talked about some of that already, right? Remembering who He is is good for us and everyone around us. Um, in fact, it's best for us and everyone around us when we remember this. That's our next blank. And bad for us and everyone around us when we forget. So it's actually loving for God to remind us. Following the logic there. It is good for you to remember that He is God and you are not. And it is bad for you to forget. So what does the loving thing do? Remind. Helps you remember, right? Yes, absolutely. Also this. Someone read Zephaniah 3. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Uh, do you see what's happening here? Who is rejoicing and singing over whom? Over yeah. God is rejoicing and singing over us. And this is not the only place we see this. Here's another example in 149. Praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song. For the Lord, in verse 4, takes delight in His people. And it says in verse 5, Let the saints rejoice in this honor and sing for joy on their beds. This is again a return. Okay, God already adores us. That's our next blank. He already adores us. He delights in us, rejoices in us, sings over us. This should be an honor that we rejoice in. That we who are not worthy of this, we are not worthy of being rejoiced in and praised by the God of, of the universe. And He does it anyway, because He loves us. Because of His love. Now this should lead us to praise and worship of Him. Absolutely should. And we cannot call that person selfish and arrogant. Not if we understand what's happening here. Okay, That He is already adoring, delighting, rejoicing in us, though we are unworthy of it. And all He asks is that we join Him in this. Rejoice in me. Rejoice in my love for you. Okay? Follow on this? God already adores us. We are the self-centered ones in this relationship. We need the practice taking the focus off ourselves. Okay? This praise is good for us. We're going to move on to confession with the little bit of time we have left. We've got about 30 minutes. Anything else before we move on? 
Okay. So the stage is set for the next part of our prayer confession, our prayer conversation. Conversations can hurt relationships as well as help them, of course. Okay? This is something we should know from the world. Just talking to each other, just having communication, does not automatically make your relationship better. So that's where we're going with this. But, but I, I want to, before we move on, make sure we're following. One of the things I like about the Acts model is that we are moving into confession with the backdrop of who God is. Okay? Already we ought to be humble in the way we are approaching this God that we have been talking about the last hour. Okay? Um, so we have begun to consider the one we're addressing. Now it's time to acknowledge who we are. And that's our next blank. Jeremiah 3, let us lie down in our shame and let our disgrace cover us. We have sinned against the Lord our God, both we and our fathers, from our youth till this day. We have not obeyed the Lord our God. Again, we and our fathers, from our youth till now, have done things our way and not His way. And that is the problem. And when we remember who it is that we're talking about, we begin to see the gravity of what we have done. Okay? Um, someone want to read Nehemiah 1? O oh, Lord God of heaven. Yes. Who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer. Your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you and we have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. So what is confession? Confession is admission and acknowledgement of sin. Okay, that's our next blank, is sin. And again, we are talking about something bigger here than, um, than trying to follow some rules, trying to check off some boxes, trying to, um, you know, get these things right so God gets happy and I can move on with the things I wanted to do. We're talking about understanding sin in terms of everything that does not come from faith is sin. Everything that is not loving the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Everything that does not take the truths about God that we just saw in the praise section and let them change the way you live your whole life. Let Him direct and Him lead and Him teach you to do better than you can do by yourself. Everything that does not let that change your life is sin. You're picking your own stupid or worse things over His in a way that's worse for you and everyone around you. And we have all done that. And that's what we're talking about here. In that context, this is what we are owning. Our selfishness, when I pick my own worst ways, it hurts other people and it hurts our relationships with them. How could, it, how could it not? How could picking what I want over what's best for my wife not hurt my relationship with my wife? There's no way it can't. Okay? And so God wants us to acknowledge this. Not just to ourselves, but also to those we've hurt. And we see this in, in lots of places. But Numbers 5, Say to the Israelites, When a man or woman wrongs another in any way, and so is unfaithful to whom? To the Lord. The Lord who has told you how you're supposed to treat your wife, your child, your neighbor, your enemy. You're unfaithful to Him when you do what you want instead. It's wronging to the other people, absolutely. But it is unfaithful to Him, the God who made you and bought you. Okay? That person is guilty and must confess the sin he has committed. He must make full restitution for his wrong. Add one-fifth to it and give it all to the person he has wronged. Matthew 5, in the, in the New Testament, Jesus says, If you're coming to worship, you're bringing your gift to the altar, and you remember that your brother has something against you, what are you supposed to do first? Yes. First go, and here's this word again, right? Be what? Be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Don't come worshiping me. Don't come <laughs> pretending everything is fine between me and you when your brother has something against you. Go fix it with your brother first. We aren't good if you are not treating the people I love right. Okay? You following the logic here? Okay. 
Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. All this is just as true in our relationship with God, more so, in fact. All sin is first and foremost against God. Um, we have this passage from, John, from Psalm 51. Have mercy to me, O God. Again, we are appealing to what we know about Him, right? According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. What does he say in verse 4? Against you and you only have I sinned. Against you and you only have I sinned. Um, who, who knows the story about David and Bathsheba? What do we know about this story? Adultery, murder, Adultery, murder the whole deal, right? He, he sees this woman he wants, and so he takes her, and he sleeps with her, and she gets pregnant, and so he sends his, her husband to the front line so he'll die. He tells the rest of the army, pull back, so he's out there by himself. He gets him killed on purpose, in battle. Uh, a man who was faithful to David and faithful to Israel and faithful to his wife, uh, to cover this up, to cover up that he has slept with this married woman, um, and and he is he is now dealing with the fallout from that. He, there are a lot of consequences that come from that for the rest of his life, um, and David is dealing with these here. What what could he possibly mean here when he says, "Against you and you only have I sinned"? He absolutely did wrong by a whole lot of people. What does he mean by this? When you're sin against others. Yes. Because God loved those people. Loved those people. This, this is the, the counterpart to when, when he said the second is like it, right, that we talked about last week. If the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. It's like loving God to love your neighbors because God loves them. Okay? And this is the counterpart to that. When we are treating others poorly, our sin is first and foremost always against God, who loves them better than anyone. Okay? And here's another thing to notice about this. Um, this, so often when we are wronged, we are given worse than we deserve, right? We deserved one thing and we got something worse. Whether it was we were harmed when we shouldn't have been, we were stolen from, something that belonged to us, what, whatever it is. We were not treated the way we ought to have been. We got worse than we deserved, okay? Again, if you compare what I deserve with what God deserves. Any way you wrong me has no comparison with how you have wronged God and the way you treated me. Your love for me, your respect for me should be a, an outgrowth of your love for God. And when you treat God's children poorly, you have treated Him so much worse than He deserved that, that their mistreatment hardly compares. Now, it matters to God. It absolutely matters to God because He loves them. But the person who has been most mistreated always, always, always is God. Always. The person who got worse from you than He deserved is God, more than anyone. Lewis talks about this, C.S. Lewis, in uh, Mere Christianity, how, how Jesus would forgive people's sins. And the Pharisees often got up in arms about this, but, but this struck Lewis um, because he thought initially, like, the gall of this, that I would tell Lynn, like if Lynn does wrong um, by Mary, and I tell Lynn, don't sweat it, I forgive you, Mary's going to have something to say about that, right? What, 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 is, what business do I have forgiving Lynn for what he did wrong to Mary? That's not my place. Now, Jesus spoke as if it was absolutely his place to forgive because he was the person most wronged. Every time, he was the person most wronged. And the Pharisees had a fit about this because only God can forgive sins, right? But Jesus was, was absolutely speaking as if I could forgive because I'm the person most wronged. And that is the scriptural teaching. He is always the one most wronged when we, when we mistreat one another. You following this? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Do you have questions, objections, any of that? Should we press it further? Well, I, I question. Sure, I sure. Objection, it's hard to do. Yeah. If somebody, uh, I give you a scenario. Um, I'm shopping at 
the mire and two people go, two young people hit the greeter, mm -hmm. the elderly lady, and just run off with stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, and they knock down her and everything, but you, and you're watching this, is that good, bad? Or it's ugly? obviously wicked, right? It's, it's obviously, obviously a wicked thing. Wicked. Yes. And has that woman been wronged? Yes. Yes, 100% she has. Does God care about that? Yes. Yes, 100% he does. But I, I know that about the woman. Yes. I'm talking about the two thieves that ran out of the store. <laughs> because God, they are part of God's too. Yes. Yes. So that's where I have. It's the indignity. And see, I'm acting like I'm judge, jury, and executioner. Well, although I saw everything go down. And... This is, this is some of what we talked about last time where we all stand condemned before him, right? right. Every one of us. Every one of us stands condemned before him. Um, and, and we have all sinned and fall short. And, and, you know, unless we repent, we too will also perish. All, all that stuff is in there. Um, so, so how do we apply? How we apply that is um, a lot of people have been wronged in that situation. And almost everyone around is implicated in that situation, bears some guilt for that situation. But I think what the scriptural teaching is, is no one has been wronged more by that mistreatment of that woman than God has. Right. That God, who has made them for better, who has saved them for better, who has died to give them better, um, and that woman, that he is the one most wronged in the way that they mistreat her. He is the one most wronged by everyone. Okay. Um, does that I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And if I don't care enough about that, I have offended him. I have wronged him as well. So, feeling for that woman or that situation is actually like they also say you can be mad, but don't cause evil. Yes. You can be frustrated. Yes. But don't sin. Yes. Because of the. Right. And there's also, remember from week one when we talked about repentance, they, the, these people who, who heard about what they had done to Christ, it says they were cut to the heart. Now what should we do? And the word was that, that you should repent. That, that being cut to the heart is a good start, but it's not what we're after. What we're after is a change of behavior. Um, and so, um, again, we, we are not to be led, governed, ruled by our feelings um, in either way. Our feelings, um, however righteous our indignation or however unrighteous it is, it is unreliable. Um, what is reliable as the, as the Lord of our life is only the, the one who made us. Um, and uh, he is the only one who has a right um, to, to rule us. Um, and that's why you can be a Democrat or a Republican and not pay attention to how things are being ruled because we only should be paying attention you know, we are going to come back to that in lesson six. <laughs> Not the Democrat-Republican <laughs> thing, but how we handle authority. Handle. Yeah. Yes, because that's going to matter in our day-to-day -day lives. So let's, right. let's hold that thought. Yes, ma'am. You just made a comment. I need to clarify. Sure. You said in her scenario that we were all at fault and we all buried you know, If we're just standing around and we see it, how are we at fault? Well, that, that depends. But if there is an extent to which I don't care enough about this woman, uh, if there's an extent to which my concern in this situation is not uh, what's best for everyone involved but my own personal safety, if, if there's an extent to which um, I am callous toward what is happening. I'm not, I'm not broken hearted by the way the woman is treated. I'm not grieved by, by what has happened in these uh, men's lives and hearts that they would treat, you know, another person, you know, created in the image of God this way. There's a whole lot of that that should, um, should grieve us and move us to action that often does not because we don't love the way God loves. Um, and so that is the way I think we are often, when you look at for example, when Jesus goes to the cross, 
all of the people who were complicit in this. Um, you, you remember many times the Pharisees did not arrest Jesus because they were afraid of a riot. They were afraid the crowds would protest. Did the crowds protest? <laughs> no. It was stunningly silent because a whole bunch of people who were around went on about their business hoping the Romans didn't turn on them. Okay? Um, and, and, we're, and we're getting off on a little bit of a rabbit trail here, and we're going to have to reel it back in. But there is very much a way in which our, um, when we are not grieved enough and do not love enough that, um, that the good of others overrides our own self-preservation, that is sin too. Does that make sense? We're going to have to work on it. Okay. Let's, let's come back to this one then. Let's keep moving from here. But can, can, we, can we agree on the point that God is the person most wronged? In, in any, any way we have mistreated one another, God is the person most wronged. Okay. Let's move on from there. Um, so how is this true? We talked about some of this. Again, the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself is related to love for God. Everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. And this is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. Because these things are tied, our failure to love others is ultimately most, first, foremost, a failure to love God. Okay? Um, and God always knows, always knows. Someone read Jeremiah 23. Can anyone hide in secret places so that I cannot see him? Declares the Lord. Do not I fill the heaven and earth? Declares the Lord. Yes, O oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. Imagine that. You discern my going out and lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Uh, Jeremiah 2, although you wash yourself with soda and use an abundance of salt, the stain of your guilt is still before me. On your clothes men find the lifeblood of the innocent poor, though you did not catch them breaking in. Yet in spite of all of this, you say, I am innocent. He is not angry with me. But I will pass judgment on you because you say I have not sinned. This only adds to our judgment to, to pretend that we are innocent. Uh, before me, before God's judgment, see, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will confess to God. So each of us will give an account of himself to God. God always, always knows. Before the word is on your tongue, when your thoughts are still afar off, he knows. He always knows. So our confession is not admitting things he doesn't know. That is not what we're talking about here. It is owning up. Admitting our selfishness and foolishness and accepting responsibility for the pain we've caused. Now, this is usually true in our other relationships as well. Most often when I have to confess to my wife, it's not something she doesn't know I did. Okay? That happens sometimes, but that's not usually the way this goes. Usually I have to own something that we both know I did. Okay? Usually she knows she's been hurt. It's just a matter of whether I'm going to acknowledge it, whether I'm going to own it, whether I'm going to recognize what I've done. So if everybody knows it, if God knows it, if my wife knows it, if, whoever, if people know it, why is this important? How does this help the relationship? Because you've hurt God and you need to repent. Absolutely. It changes your action. Mm -hmm. Ideally, right, it changes your action. Hopefully, right? It humbles us to confess. Yes, yes. We're, getting, we're, 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 we're honing in on it here, people. Um, it allows the relationship to begin the process of moving past the offense and toward reconciliation. And by contrast, to refuse to admit our fault is to keep the threat alive. Now, if I have hurt my wife, for example, and my wife knows I've hurt my wife, and I won't own it, I won't admit it, I won't acknowledge it, I won't, uh, I won't forsake it, I won't, I won't repent of it, can she let her guard down? No. No. Absolutely not. Okay. 
The threat is still very much alive. If I will not acknowledge what it is and that it's wrong and that it's hurt her and that I'm going to try and do better, if I won't do that, the threat is still there. It is absolutely still there. And there will not be reconciliation with this imminent threat standing between the two of you. It just isn't going to happen. Okay? We don't confess for confession's sake. Real, meaningful confession is the first step in a healing process that involves admitting fault, apologizing, and then turning, as you've said here, repenting, in other words, renouncing and forsaking our selfish, hurtful behavior. Uh, Proverbs 28, He who conceals his sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses and does what? Renounces, renounces them, finds mercy. Let the wicked forsake his way and, ev and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn, turn, turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will freely pardon. Paul, when he's talking to King Agrippa here, says that he preaches they should repent to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. This confession is about owning this, owning this, acknowledging the hurt, and then turning away from it, okay? Um, in a way that allows the relationship to be healed, reconciled, to begin to move forward, okay? What good is confession without a commitment to the rest of the process. What good is admitting sin and still refusing to repent? Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Okay? The point is to restore, as our next blank, relationships hurt by our selfishness. And we're we're going to not move on to that next point yet. But are, are we following this? The confession is acknowledging your part in the problem and then renouncing your part in the problem so that the relationship can begin to be healed, restored, move forward. We getting that? Questions, comments, objections on any of that? What was the blank? Um, the good is confession without a commitment to blank. The rest of the process, yes. So if you're just going to come every day and say, uh, wife, I know I, I did this to you, um, I, you know, I... Um, Whatever it is. I spoke harshly to you this morning. Um, I admit that. And, and then continue speaking harshly to her um, without any sort of commitment to fix this, to turn back from this, to renounce this, to reject this. Um, that, that is not what we're after here. We're not, we're not after here either trying to cover up our sin or trying to live in our sin. Um, we're after here confessing it and renouncing it um, for the sake of the relationship. Questions, comments, objections on any of that? All right, and this works from the other side as well. When others hurt us with their selfishness, God wants us to do what? Forgive, Forgive them. And, and this is for the same reason, to restore these relationships. As God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have. Forgive as what? Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Forgive us our debts. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus has given us an example. Forgive us our debts, for we have also forgiven our debtors. And he circles back to this at the end of the prayer. If you forgive men when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Um, what, what's the point he's trying to make here? Let me, let me, uh, yeah, go ahead. If you don't, if you don't forgive others the way he's forgiven you, then you're not going to be forgiven. Yeah. If... To us, there's just a level, like, the difference between a white lie and there's a level of being wrong. Yeah. For you for us. You know, you could have snatched a penny versus a million dollars. Okay. The guy that stole what's that trader guy that went to jail? Oh yeah, yeah. Made off or whoever made yeah. off or whatever. He's very bad, but if somebody snitched a yeah. dollar, yeah. you know, off the kitchen table, you don't get sent to prison. Yeah. So but in God's eyes, uh, he can't even look at us. He's, 
almighty. He's perfect. He, does, he can't even see sin. He can't even look at sin. So us acting, me the one that snatched the one dollar, is not any better than the person that's in prison or ripping off a million dollars. It's all the same <coughs> to God. And so for me to say he's worse or better is even more convicting. Yeah. And there's a limit to what we'll forgive, right? Right. Right. And the person most wronged every time is God, right? Always. Right. What, what is the example here to forgive us? He is forgiven, right? The, the way he puts it in the one parable is that the, the guy who's been forgiven, you know, millions of dollars or whatever it was, and then he goes out and he throws the guy in jail for not giving him a few hundred dollars. He, he, and, the, and the king who finds this out is terribly unhappy with him and throws him in jail um, because he who has been forgiven so much will not forgive this little or amount. Um, so let's, let's put this in real practical terms. If, if Lou uh, hurts me, okay, if she wrongs me, if she does wrong by me, and she owns it, she acknowledges it, she recognizes it, she makes an attempt to come to me and confess it and make it right and try to fix this relationship, and I now say, no, I'm not okay. We're not okay. We're not doing this. I'm, I'm not forgiving you. Who's now in the wrong? You are. I'm now the problem. Yeah. I'm now the problem in the relationship. Okay? She is trying to get this thing fixed. She is not perfect, and not one of us is or ever has been perfect. When we refuse reconciliation, when we refuse forgiveness to give it to one another, now we're the problem in the relationship. Okay? We are being called to, from both sides, um, commit to this process of reconciliation and healing. Um, yes? Can I just make one sort of caveat? Yeah. Potentially abusive relationships where you need to get legitimate outside help. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, that, yeah. That's not the same as refusing forgiveness. Right. Right? So that, that's going to be a rabbit trail. We're not going to go very far down. But, but, but yes. Yes, yes. Even if the person says, oh, I'm sorry, and it keeps happening, and that's something that is a difference. Yes, those are case by case, and there are scriptures that we could use to talk about all that. But forgiveness is, is no longer holding against you, holding the debt against you, um, which does not necessarily mean subjecting yourself to, um, to repeated wrongs from people who are not repenting and are not trying to, um, to do better. Um, some of that we're called to and some of that we aren't. We're, we're not going to cover all those uh, possibilities tonight. Um, but yes, that's not necessarily the same thing. Um, but if you're in an abuse situation, let's say you're out of that, reliving and having that argument with that person in your head is actively staying in that relationship. And at some point, that's going to destroy you, or yeah. you have to make a decision and say, "I gotta let that, let that go. If that happened. Yeah. Um, we're going to move to the next level. I have to forgive myself as well um, for me to move forward." Yeah. And that again, that's the if you have that knowledge, if you have that relationship with the Father, with yeah. the Lord, then there is nothing. Yeah. There is nothing, nothing. It doesn't spouse, child, work, illness. This is the relationship between us and him. Yeah. Yeah, and, and again, God is pushing us toward things that are good for us, right? Um, I think it was Augustine who said, resentment is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies, right? There, there's an extent to which our refusal to forgive harms us as well. Um, even when the relationship is beyond repair, um, our refusal to forgive harms us um, and, um, and creates a problem between us and God, too, um, that, that we are not... Uh, you can't see, you can't... I'm like, what is it? My mom used to say, you can't, change, you can't chase two rats. Yes. You have to... <laughs> you're going to miss out on everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You've got to decide if you're going to be fighting in your mind with that.
situation or that person or whatever, that's where you, that's the trail. You like yeah. using trails yeah. that you're stuck in. And, and it's hard. I'm not saying it's easy to get out of that. No, no, we're not but, talking about anything easy here. But without that relationship to God, it's, it's even more difficult. Impossible, yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. We're going to say something. Uh, Moses said, you know, he said, okay, you guys can divorce, whatnot. But God actually was talking to the guy and he said, well, actually, you know, I mean, he did that because their hearts were hard, but really they're not supposed to. So there, there has to be some way, I mean, you know, through prayer or, you know, for not to part. I mean, there's got to be some way, you know, I'm not saying, you know, I mean, I wouldn't want to get beat up every night, you know, if I was a woman, but, you know, there's technically, I mean, God said, well, no, there's, there's really not supposed to be the Lord. I'm not, not supposed to be breaking up. Yeah, and, and again, that's... That's a whole other... What, yeah, that, that's another another thing that we could go a long way into um but but let's let's at least acknowledge the heart of god on this right um yes ma'am yeah if we think about the, the the outcome associated with unforgiveness right unforgiveness is something within our hearts what's the what's the outcome what's the uh, in in terms of our relationship with god it produces greater separation between me and god right right Okay, God adores me. He wants to be in relationship with me. Yeah. So let's say Pastor Joey offends me, right? Mm -hmm. And he wounds me and he hurts me. And he comes to me and he says, Mary, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. I'll never wound you and hurt you again. Blah, 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 woo, woo, woo. And I'm like, no, Pastor Joey, you know what? Look, I'm going to stay bitter here. And I'm never, ever going to forgive you because you're a pastor. Right? Does that reconcile and reconnect me to God? It can't. No. Of course it, it doesn't. And so, so am I robbing God by keeping myself from Him with that unfruit? I mean, am I robbing God by maintaining bitterness and unforgiveness in my heart? Am I robbing God from that which? He adores and loves and sacrificed his only son for. So that's why forgiveness, no matter how harsh the treatment was or the sin was against me, that's why it's valuable, it's to my benefit to forgive so that my relationship with God can be even more reconciled than um, can be completely reconciled. Does that make sense? It does. Did uh, I say that right? Yeah, yeah. You're, you're, yeah. You're getting at something that I think is really at the heart of things. And this is again, if we if we put this confession discussion back in the context of the adoration discussion we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. the difference between what, like, if if I'm if I'm beefing with Mary because she has treated me worse than I deserved. The difference between what I deserved and what Mary gave me and the difference between what God deserved and what I gave him are, are not comparable. I have given him so much worse than he deserved than what anybody could do to me. And I think, well, I'm still owed this and I'm still having a problem because I'm owed something I didn't get. Again, what God has given me that I did not deserve is incomparable with anything else I think I don't have. And so if, I'm, if I want to focus instead on this, where I've been slighted a little bit, instead of how I have been given so much more than I have ever deserved or ever could repay, then, then I'm, I'm, I've, I've got my focus, again, back on me and what I want and what I think I need and, and, and what I, instead of on God and what He has already done for me that I could never repay and never deserved. Okay? And, and, and it keeps us, as Mary said, it keeps us over here in this, this little self-centered thing instead of in that, that reconciled relationship with God where I'm living out of that and, and loving out of that and forgiving out of that in recognition for what I have been given and what I have been forgiven. Okay? Um, 
Another, and that's his heart for that. There's another parable that goes like, it's like a farmer that has all these graves and he needs to get it harvested by a certain amount of time. And he goes out to the town and, said, and grabs whoever to work on this farm. And he says, I'll give you a day's wages. Mm -hmm. So the morning people come in, they do whatever, but then there's still more stuff that they got to harvest. So he goes back out and the get some more and get more workers mm -hmm. and tells them, I'm going to give the you a day's wages. So when he starts giving the wages to everybody, the day people are upset with the night people, with the evening people, because we've been here since sun up to sundown, and mm -hmm. they get the same as the people that just came yeah. in at two o'clock. Yeah. That's not fair. Mm -hmm. and, and the point Jesus makes explicitly there is, look, I can give whatever I want to give. It's all mine to give, right? The point he doesn't make explicitly there, but that is implied in all the other parts of Scripture is none of you, it would be like if I gave you $40 billion at the end of the day and I gave you all $40 billion, none of you deserve that. So what, what are you complaining about? Right? I mean, I think I want it because I don't want to pay taxes. <laughs> <laughs> you, you want it, Brenda. You want it. Even if you take 25% home, um, give it to the church. Um, yeah. Um, yes. So again, we got, we got to land this plane, but, but we, it, has to, it has to happen there. The way we deal with our sins and other sins has to happen in that context of how you have been forgiven and how you have been loved by God, though you didn't deserve it. You never deserved it. Okay? That, that's where all this has to happen. Confession and forgiveness. Um, did we do this one already? Confession and for repentance and forgiveness aren't just religious rituals. Again, these are not just empty things that we do because, you know, we're checking off religious boxes or whatever. The purpose is to restore damaged relationships. They allow both parties to demonstrate committed love, even in spite of our failures. So trust and closeness can be restored. And I'm going I'm to read part of this Psalm, one thir Psalm 32. <laughs> Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him. Um, therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you while you, are fa while you may be found. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing all you upright in heart. This man is singing and praising because of the grace and mercy and forgiveness he has been given by God. Confession lets us show us his, lets God show us his mercy and grace and helps us begin to see how big they are, which leads us back to praise. Adoration and confession both lead to each other. The better you see who he is, the better you see who you are by comparison. The better you see who you are by comparison and the fact that he still loves you, the more you're going to praise him, okay? And and I want you to notice this too before we move off of this. A lot of times we don't really want to own the depth of our sin, the ugliness of our sin. We, we are afraid to bring that into the light. That shows some sort of distrust in the fact that God really will love you anyway, really will cover that with the blood of Jesus, all that sort of stuff. And it keeps us out of this. If we haven't really acknowledged who we are and what we have done and the ugliness and the depth of it, we haven't really given him a chance to show us that, yeah, I knew all that. I knew it all the whole time, and I loved you anyway. I loved you enough to cover it with the blood of my son. Okay? When, when, we, when we shortchange the confession, we don't get the full benefit of really understanding what we have been forgiven. If we really haven't owned who we are, we really haven't given him a chance to show us how great his mercy is. You following that? So, so trying to dodge this confession so you can pretend that you're not all that bad, so you can pretend that God might still love you anyway, shortchanges him. It doesn't give him a chance to show you how gracious and loving he is. Together, adoration and confession, better seeing God who, for who he is and ourselves for who we are. Remind us that all we can hope for is mercy. That what we actually deserve is punishment. That that would be just of this God. Remind us then to be grateful for the grace we get all the time and the incredible price God paid for it. And remind us that God is good either way. He is just to punish and or merciful to forgive. However he responds. 
again, and we talked about this some earlier, that when he disciplines us, it is for our good. When he gives us mercy, it is for our, all of it is aimed at our good because he is loving. He is not out to punish and destroy us. This is a good place from which to continue praying and doing all things in Jesus' name, through whom we have gained access by faith into the grace in which we now stand, that it is only through Jesus that we can come before him anyway. On the other hand, our prayers can die he here. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to say, save, nor his ear too dull to hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. This is the other option right if we refuse to own these sins um, to renounce and confess and move forward as always we have two paths going in opposite directions so choose life for the lord is your life he has come that you would have life and have it to the full okay um, any questions comments objections before we close all right so this is we're going to cover thanksgiving and supplication next week but this is adoration and confession acknowledging who god is and who we are by comparison okay and this gives him a chance again to show us who he is to show us his love and mercy lord we want to thank you for this time i want to thank you for bringing these people here i want to thank you for the health that we have to get here for this building that we are sitting in for this time we've had together um, help us to make good use of it all in this week to come uh, it's in the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen.